following is a presentation of the TNH Podcast Network. I think he's going to bring it back to the eighth grade days. I think Roy Williams is going to look seventh in the eyes and be like, look, you're going to be my seventh man tonight. I'm putting you on that goddamn court. You're going to put the ball in the basket, and you're going to do those things that you did on those white kids from wherever the hell you're from when you are playing eighth grade basketball. Dominated. You're just going to do that against Auburn and show them what's good. The guy was dunking a basketball and having ball as life highlight tapes in eighth grade. Did I even kiss a girl in eighth grade? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. No. What is good, everyone? Welcome to the fifth episode of the Hoopcats podcast on the TNH Podcast Network. My name is Sam Eggert, and I'm here back with the goddamn gang, Yannick Kikoris and Matt Erb, although Matt Erb is actually not here today. I'm just used to saying that, so that's why I said it. But forget that. Yanni, how are you? Feeling great today. It's a good day to be live. It's a great day to be Yanni. I don't know what else to tell you. I'm ready to go. Ready to talk some backseat hoops? Oh, yes. A whole lot of those. Today we'll be uh, doing a little bit of college hoop talk, talking up the games from last Thursday night. We'll be talking about the games we got coming up tonight on Friday. In addition to that, we'll be doing a little bit of NBA playoff talk in addition to some Celtics talk. But for now, let's begin it with our bracket updates. Yanni, how's it going? How's your bracket? (laughs) So my two brackets in the Money League, they ain't looking too hot right now, as stated before. I mean, my Duke bracket, I took a lot of chances, just didn't work. I'm in, I think, 105th place with that one. My Virginia one winning, I think, is up to, like, 47th, but it just, I don't want Virginia to win, so it's just a lose-lose for me. But at 11.30 on the first day of the tournament, before all the games started, I was in class, decided to take a poop break, just to, like, sit down, just decided to, you know, see, maybe make one more bracket. So I did. Made a Gonzaga bracket. That bracket is 99.3% right now, and I had no idea till I just checked. No, it's not. Craziness. You're kidding me. What's your Final Four? Craziness. Gonzaga, it's literally like the worst Final Four ever. Hold on. I'll pull it up. Well, well, I got Gonzaga beating, um, who was on the other side? LSU, I think. LSU, they're still in it. Still in it. Just crazy. Nas Reed. Yeah, we got Final Fours, LSU, Gonzaga, Virginia, Kentucky. Gonzaga takes down Kentucky. And for some reason, my tiebreaker is not correctly updated here, but... The score is 78-78 in the championship game. It's going to be a tie in the championship game. Yes, and they're just going to call it, and they're going to give it to Gonzaga because of a coin toss to end the game. Is that what happens? Is that the golden rule for when there's a tie? Yes. They do a coin toss? Yes. They transition from rock, paper, scissors to coin toss. 07, maybe? So I thought it always used to be a one or a two behind the back. That, and, like, oh. you guess it, but it's always a two. You're thinking of the WNBA here. You're right. Yes. That's a, that's a professional thing. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Yes, it's all good. Yeah, we all so make mistakes. my bracket not looking as good. It kind of got busted a while ago, and I'm I'm looking at it right now, and like this bracket was perfect up to the Syracuse game, but I picked St. Louis to beat Virginia Tech. Yeah, you know I picked like a bunch of really dumb stuff, and then like once Michigan lost, that kind of ruined my bracket because I had them in the Final Four. But I don't know, it's not terrible. I still have Duke, UVA, and Kentucky in the Final Four, so that's still holding up. Who got knocked out of that other region? What region? The Gonzaga region. I had Michigan in the Final Four. Yeah. I should have picked, I don't know, I mean, like, I thought it's, Jordan Poole yeah. had that magic again, but, Correct. like, I don't know, they didn't look good last night. Terrible. Speaking of that game, what was it, 4-4? Four to four Awful. With seven minutes played? Yeah, my friend, before the game, he's like, dude, this over is going to hit huge, 126, like, this is going to be the easiest money I've ever made. He threw 10 bucks on the over. Oh, he bet it? Of 126. It was 4-4. to four through, like, four minutes, and then six to four through 12. Yeah, it was hard to watch. It was bad. Awful. And then, like, I flipped the channel to the other game, and it's the same thing. Like, yes. neither team could put the ball in the basket. The late-night games last night were not of as much excellence as the earlier ones, Tennessee game. And what was the other game last night? It was Tennessee-Purdue, and then <laughs> um, it's slipping my mind. Uh, it was the UVA game. Yes, yes. It was UVA versus you-know-who. Those guys. The Ducks. The Ducks. The Dirty Ducks. A lot of people thought the Ducks would pull an upset in that one. They almost did it, but they didn't. 
Virginia's had some close calls, huh? I feel like every game for, for Virginia's been pretty damn close this year. <laughs> I mean, down six at half in the first round. I think they ended up blowing out that team, but, like, they've had some close games in this tournament. Yeah, Oklahoma gave them a scare, yep. and then they pulled away towards the end of the game, winning that one 63-51. But last night, we're talking a Sweet 16 game with a number one seed facing a 12 seed final score of 53-49. to Craziness. I'm looking at the other scores from the tournament so far. Minnesota scored 50 against Michigan State. Fairleigh Dickinson scored 49 against Gonzaga. And Abilene Christian scored 44 against Kentucky. (laughs) Other than that, nobody has scored less than, except for, and then Old Dominion scored 48 points. Other than that, Virginia is like the fourth lowest scoring game of the entire tournament, and they won. Yes. I guess that proves they can play good defense, but like... That's what they do. That it's, shows that they're susceptible to not putting the ball in the basket at all. Correct. And they're playing against Virginia. I, I mean, Virginia's playing against Purdue. Carson Edwards can score at will. That kid Klein last night Ryan hit some Klein. of the most absurd shots. I don't know if you saw the game. I, w- I was watching that one, yeah. Wow. I have never seen someone throw up so many heat checks and they all go in. It was crazy. He, he, he was blacking out. broke Grant Williams on one play. Step back, hit a three to tie the game. We had a bench celebration on our couch. It was one of those homie backs. We had a guy jumping around, a guy on the floor. It was Somebody literally threw the Lakers. something. Somebody threw something. It was literally the Lakers after Lance Stevenson. Like, that was unbelievable. Unbelievable. He, oh, my God. Did like, he step on his shoe? Yes. Does the bench reaction cover up all that? Yes. Absolutely. In every sense of the word. Yes. Also, Gonzaga is sadly impressing me, and I hate to say it. They are impressing me so much. Yeah, I didn't want to see Gonzaga do well either, but that that being said, I feel like Gonzaga versus Duke will probably be the best game we get this whole tournament. Yes, it has to be. I think that side of the bracket's going to come out with the winner, regardless of who it is. I I just think Gonzaga and Duke are the two best teams, and they're going to meet up eventually, and it's going to come down to a brawl like the first time. Yeah, aside from those two teams, I think for the teams that are still alive, I think my dark horse... Right now, it's got to be Houston. Yes, Because I think that they've proven that they're pretty legit as they spanked Georgia State. They demolished Ohio State, who a, was a pretty good team in their own right. Not the highest ranking seed, but I thought they could play. Still a good team, yeah. And now they're going to play Kentucky. And Kentucky, over the course of this entire season, has proven that they're susceptible to losing Correct. against good teams. We've um, seen it multiple times. Exactly. And, like, I don't know. What's the deal with Washington right now? Is he still hurt? or is he? I think he's still hurt. I haven't. I don't know if there's an official ruling on his status. Yeah. But I, I think he's, as far as I know, he's hurt. I'm pretty sure he's still out. So that's a major blow. Yeah. Keldon Johnson's still a damn good player, but. Right. Tyler Houston, they can all score, but I mean, Houston's got the experience. Houston's just a well-coached team with a bunch of veterans, and they've got like just like really good players. They're March ready. Exactly, they're That's the kind the of team that you like. want. Like Corey Davis Jr. has been unbelievable this Correct. whole tournament. Galen Robinson Jr. is a beast. He's a defensive menace. They all shoot well from three. They're going to be good. I'm confident. Me too. Very confident. Tonight we got a good slate of games. We got Houston, Kentucky. We got Duke, Virginia Tech, which a lot of people think is going to be closer than expected. We got LSU, Michigan State, and then a sneaky game, Auburn, UNC. I think Auburn's ready to go against these UNC boys. I think we're going to see a little upset city tonight. Auburn's looked pretty damn good this whole time. I'm Extremely. like, Did I'm they looking have a couple forward to that close game. calls? Yes. Do I think they have some players who are ready to go against UNC? Absolutely. Their guard play is absurd. Bryce Brown, they can just score at will from beyond the line. And I know UNC can too. They can defend well. They get out in transition. But I'm predicting a little Auburn upset tonight over UNC. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt it at all. I really think that can happen too. I think that UNC still is a really good team. They're going to put up a great fight. But I don't know. Something tells me that Kobe White, Cam Johnson, not going to have great games. I'm predicting it right now. I think yeah. Luke May is going to keep them alive like he usually does. And then, like, aside from that, like, their roster's kind of weak afterwards. Nasir Little's probably playing the best basketball of his college career so right far. Right now, yes. But that being said, he hasn't proven any consistency no. this whole season. For a guy who's projected a top five pick. Yeah, so, like, I just don't know what to expect from him because he's been impossible to predict. He's playing about 18 minutes a game, scoring, like, 10 points. But yep. he'll have games where he's scoring... 15 to 22, and then I'll also have games where he's scoring three to, like, eight points. Correct. But my sleeper is one of the greatest high school basketball players of all time. No, I'm not talking about Thon Maker. Nope. I'm talking about Seventh Woods. I knew you were going to say Seventh it. Woods. Now, let me get a quick correction. Yanni, you Greatest know eighth grade basketball player of all time. Fair point. Eighth grade. I think he's going to bring it back to the eighth grade days. I think Roy Williams is going to look seventh in the eyes and be like, look, 
You're going to be my seventh man tonight. I'm putting you on that goddamn court. You're going to put the ball in the basket, and you're going to do those things that you did on those white kids from wherever the hell you're from when you were playing eighth grade basketball. Dominated. You're just going to do that against Auburn and show them what's good. The guy was dunking a basketball and having ball as life highlight tapes in eighth grade. Did I even kiss a girl in eighth grade? I'm not sure. No, no. I'm not sure. No. <laughs> He's, he's got a good set of feet under him. He's ready to go for tonight. It's going to be interesting. I think we got a lot of interesting games. I'm excited. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Also, real quick, did you hear the story about Ty Outlaw? No. So, Enlighten me. Ty Outlaw, Virginia Tech, he was away for the tournament. Oh, I did his, hear about this, yes. His roommate was smoking weed in the room. He got arrested, and so when Ty Outlaw came back to Virginia, he also got arrested, even though he was no part of it. That's crazy. So they had to clear off everything. And he can play tonight because he passed a drug test. That's good to hear because I was so. worried about that. Because when I first read that, I only saw, like, the headline. Yes. Cause... And I assumed that that happened in California because right, that's so where they I. were playing. So I was like, yeah. weed's legal in California. Like, I know it's they're not allowed to smoke it in the NCAA, but, like, him getting arrested for that, right, I thought that was pretty excessive. Yes. I was even thinking, like, there might have been racist connotations, which there still might have been because who knows, Virginia yeah, police, know. I don't want to assume things, but, like, yeah. whatever. That's another topic for a different day but like i'm just glad that he's playing me not so much but for game wise i guess so yeah well like you know what i mean like the guy shoots in terms of the percent from three he's a whapper as some would say he does whap threes whaps but just in terms of the controversy that could have surrounded that whole ordeal you know it's just stuff you don't want to deal with especially in the tournament rather than just like the regular season or something like that just how it goes it's the way of the road. So let's move on to a little bit of NBA talk. We're looking at the NBA playoff standings, and right now we currently have the Bucks still holding the top seed in the East, followed by the Raptors. The Sixers, who have moved up to the third, and then you've got Indiana, Boston, Detroit, Brooklyn, and Miami locking up the last couple seeds with yep. Orlando, who's only half a game behind Miami, and then Charlotte, who's one and a half games behind Miami. How do you see these shaping up? Do you think that's going to stay the way it is, or do you see Orlando making maybe like a hot streak to win the eighth seed in the conference? I think top five are pretty like secured position-wise right now. I don't think there's going to be a change between them. I'm not sure. I think the Magic and Heat show up on just different nights. It all depends who they play. Like The Magic the other night, I thought they were going to be a way better team than they were, and they got blown out of the water by 25. Yeah. So like the Magic show up in nights, and then they just... I don't even know who they are. They magically disappear. They're just remarkably inconsistent. Incredibly. I mean, it's either they're having a game where it's Vucevic who's dominant, maybe Jonathan Isaac's doing something, Fournier's hitting shots, TJ Augustine's looking the same way he did seven years ago, but then again, they'll have nights where it's like Vuce may not be in, on top of his game entirely, and, you know, things will just like fall apart. fall apart from there. It's a slippery slope for them. And also with Gordon's inconsistent play, that doesn't help them at all. Yes, not at all. And, like, going back to that game last night against Detroit, I mean, I think Detroit proved why they can be a legitimate force in the playoffs because they did what they're supposed to do. Correct. Which is their front line dominating the game and then kicking the ball out for three because Wayne Ellington had a huge day going 7-13 to from deep, hitting for uh, 25 points. Incredible Griffin had 20-10. and 10. Yep. Drummond had 18-18 and 18 on 9 of 10 shooting. I mean, they were looking really good last night. Not to mention Bruce Brown got in the starting lineup, and I didn't... Yes, I also didn't see that coming or expect it or just... Because in the beginning of the season, I was thinking he had bust written all over him. Not yes, even that he was like too. too high of a pick, but like I remember like hearing things about him. I thought he'd be pretty good, and he just wasn't doing anything. Yes. Granted, he played 15 minutes, took one shot, hit it from three, but I don't know. Plus 14, Yeah, it's pretty good. Pretty all good. that matters. I think the biggest stat in the game is plus minus, so... I could not That's agree more. Opinion. I'm a big plus minus guy, too. Huge. But regardless, I think whoever does end up getting the eight spot is going to get swept by the Bucks. So just a soft topic for those teams. The Bucks are ready to go. What I really want to talk about is the mix between the eight spot for the West and the potential. I can't remember who I said this to. I can't remember if I said it to you. I can't remember if I said it on the pod. Do we have a potential Warriors-Thunder first-round matchup on the way? That 100% could happen. And the Spurs have been surging over the past few. So. Yes, they've been playing great. 7-3 and three over the last 10 Oklahoma City's 4-10 and 10 over the last 10. Right. I mean, sorry, 4-6 and six over the last 10. So, yeah, that could happen. And over the past four years, you could argue that Golden State versus Oklahoma City has been the most captivating Western Conference matchup just, like, in, in general. Yes. Like, there really hasn't been any other team that puts together consistently just 
all around. Emotional, good basketball battles where you see Russ and KD butting heads. You got Dur- uh, you got Curry, you got Thompson, Paul George, Stephen Adams, just a bunch of beasts who want to win, playing good, competitive, no BS basketball like we'll see from the Lakers. But that's beside the point. Yeah, I would really want to see that. But I think the biggest story in the Western Conference right now is the Portland Trailblazers. Yeah, forty-seven and twenty-seven. They've been a great team all year. Two beyond huge, devastating injuries. Huge. It's so sad when this time of the year comes around and guys are getting hurt in the way that they are. And it's funny because, like, I've been thinking this whole season, like, we haven't seen devastating injuries really to the extent that we saw the year before, right. where we had like Boogie, Kristaps, all that stuff go down. Yep. But did you see Nurkic's injury? Did you see his leg snap? Did not see it live. Sadly, had to watch a video of it. It was thrown in my face. I almost threw up. It was nauseating. Legitimately nauseating. Gross. Like, we saw Hayward's injury. We saw, I don't know if you remember um, Isaiah Cannon's injury from yep. last year with the Suns. Mm-hmm. That one was bad, too. Well, but the Nurkic injury. Too, Karis Levert, someone. Levert this year, Levert he this year. dislocated his foot. Yes. So, well, it did look really gruesome, but. It, not as bad. He's back and playing. He's back, yes. So, but, but not playing. Nurkic he's not injury. playing well. But the Nurkic wow. injury, oh, my God. Wow. I, I like, I was watching that game live, Oof. and I didn't really get a look at it when it happened, but I just saw Jared Dudley pull his jersey over his mouth and start gagging as he walked away from it, just like... It gives me the chills just to think about it. Like, it legitimately, though. I'm not even, chills. Like, not even just saying it. Like, I legitimately, like... Goosebumps. Goosebumps, exactly. It's awful. And you know it's bad when, like you said, guys are having the reactions that they're having. Russ, D'Angelo Russell... And again, this is not the first time he's done this because he did this at the Karis LeVert injury too. Yes. He ran into the locker room. Like, he ran away. He awful. couldn't be near it. I'm surprised nobody yacked on the court, to be honest. After seeing that, oh my gosh. I would have passed out. If I saw that If live, I was live right there, I think I would have, yeah. Passed out. I've never passed out before from something like traumatic, <laughs> but I think that might have done it for me. I passed out twice just from people passing out. So when I see people pass out, just an immediate pass out for me. Do you care to elaborate? It's weird. I don't know. One time, we were at a golf event. My brother wasn't feeling good. He was a little dehydrated. He passed out. And so all of a sudden, someone turns around, and they're like, oh, like Nico's on the ground having a seizure. And all of a sudden, uh, he wasn't, but he was just on the ground, passed out. All of a sudden, next thing I know, I'm awake. Someone's snapping over my face, and I'm looking at the blue sky. <laughs> so, And supposedly, I hit the guy next to me as I was falling, decided not to catch me. Just let me hit the ground. <laughs> so I don't know what the deal is with that, but don't pass out in front of me or else I will, you will join pass you out on too. the ground. <laughs> hey, but if I'm near you and I see someone else pass out, I will make sure to come by your side mm-hmm. and make sure you don't fall hard on the ground because we need you for national. you got to have a checklist. First thing is, did I see the person pass out? Check off yes or no. If yes, go to the next diagram, which is, Either turn me away or grab me as hard as I can so I don't fall to the ground. And also make sure you have a glass of cold water yes, by I your side. Yes, I love that. So you can either throw it in his face or give it to him once he wakes up. <laughs> it also happened the first day of freshman year of college. Some girl passed out, and I literally grabbed my friend, and I was like, come here. And I just passed out into his chest, and then I just stood right back up. Did you, did you just continue on with what you were doing, or did you, the like... The ambulance guys who came for the girl was like, oh, like, we heard you passed out. I was like, yeah, no, it's fine. Like, it happens. <laughs> I'm just used to it. Yeah. A little, so bit, of, a little saw, bit of fainting so action. if I saw Nurkic, oh, my, I'd be on the ground. No chance. Do you, well, Nurkic, and, I don't know if Nurkic passed out. He was just... Oh, he his was, leg yes. snapped in half. But, but that, is that the same type of thing oh, that would probably, get you going? Probably would have done the job. Yeah. It definitely would have done the job. So. I can't... I'm trying to think if I've ever been on the court. Actually, no. One time we had I had a a rec basketball game. We were playing at the Oak Hill Court in Newton, Massachusetts, which is really like a small. Okay. So the the walls aren't that far from the out of bounds line, and this kid was I was actually going up for the layup. Yep. And some kid was playing defense on me. He was trying to do like a chase down block on me, but it was sixth grade basketball, so I don't know what he was thinking. Yeah, it wasn't pinning that LeBron game seven. Not even so. close. If I think he fouled me and I still made the layup, yeah, obviously. Humble I'm, brag. I'm, I'm that kind of player. Yeah, humble brag. But Carry he, on. he couldn't stop himself, um, so he's running pretty fast. He goes straight into the wall, puts his wrist out, and like instead of having his hands up like 
you're doing like hands in the air like 10. Yep. Like hands like I don't care. He kind of had his wrist turned in like he was going to go punch the wall. Oh. So his, my. his fist goes straight into the wall and his wrist snapped in half. Did you hear it? Oh my God, everyone uh, heard it. No. Everyone heard oh, it. Oh, oh. No, and he's, <laughs> and he's, the funniest part is, though, he didn't really realize at first. He starts <sighs> running back on defense. No way. And then, I swear to God, and then he starts, then he looks down. He goes, oh, my God, oh, my God, my no wrist is in half. And no then, way. like, his parents, just, like, took him away and it was whatever. Oh and I think one kid actually, my. like, left to yoke it because he thought he was going to puke, but I don't know if he actually puked. What? Yeah, but that's my injury story. Actually, no, I have that one is, other one. That is bananas. <laughs> so... I had a soccer game, and yeah, somehow I played soccer. I know okay. what you're thinking. Yeah, um, that was my first question. Good answer. I wasn't bad, but uh, <laughs> it's funny question. because when I <laughs> Good when, answer. when I first started playing, I was really bad. But makes sense. My coach, who was my my best friend's dad from home, he knew me pretty well, and he was like, "Sam, your position is the distractor." <laughs> so you're going to play on offense. Just make sure you don't go off sides and talk as much crap to the other team as you want. <laughs> as long as you're not too loud, you won't get carded. That's what he said to sixth grade me. And granted, it worked because I scored four goals that season. But on to the Wayland game. So the first part of the game in the first half, this is a real weird day all around because I don't remember if we were winning or losing, but a dog ran onto the field. Okay. And it was like chasing people around. And for some reason, I got the idea where I was like, maybe if I go up to the dog and try and intimidate it, it will run away. So I go up to the dog, I like bark at it, and then the dog immediately goes at me. Oh, no. And like, this is in the middle of a game. Like, play had not stopped. <laughs> like, or play might have stopped because the dog is on the field, and the dog's chasing me around. All my friends are like laughing at me. They still bring it up to me to this day. And then eventually, the culminating thing was I ran to our bench, and I was wearing cleats. Remember yes. that? So I jump onto the bench slip because I had no friggin' traction. Correct. And the dog is still right there, like, all over me. And, like, he wasn't doing anything to me, but, like, I was scared out of, like, lifeless. Right. And How was big was this dog? It was, like, a border collie, probably, like, okay. 30 pounds or something like that. Yeah. I don't know. But it was, like, a stray dog. So I guess we didn't know if it had rabies or whatever. So, like, that's why some kids were nervous. But, like, it's I a fair was, point. I don't know why I, tr- like, went up to it and, like, barked at it. That was dumb. But later on in that game, after that had blown over... There was a play outside the 18, and the ball was, like, sitting there stagnant. And me and another kid went at it, me and an opposing player. And the only thing that I was good at in soccer is kicking the ball hard. Yep. So I go to kick the ball, and the kid plants his foot right in front of it. And, like, I thought I tore his ACL because I just kicked Aww. right I kicked right through it. And the kid was <laughs> on the ground crying for, like, 15 minutes. You are putting some bad images into my mind. <laughs> I'm sorry to all of our listeners, but I love injury talk because it's kind of funny, honestly. See, I'm the opposite, but <laughs> that's <laughs> crazy. I just never forget that kid's scream. Like, and I don't even think he tore his ACL. I think he overreacted because he was in, like, 6th or 7th grade or however old be on the podcast older was. with a serial killer, folks. It's more like a serial injurer. Serial injurer. <laughs> serial like ACL terror. I like that. <laughs> but but that's beside the point. So, yeah, that's my little injury story. So Wow. Glad that I got that off my chest, even though it's not really like a thing that I really think about too often. <laughs> All right. Well, little, I think little switch up here. I have to bring up the fact that I think the Utah Jazz, if they don't have to play the Rockets in the first round or the Warriors in the second round, I think they're a Western Conference Finals team. And I'd like to hear your opinion on that. You said if they don't have to play the Warriors? So right now, they're the five. The Rockets are the four. So if they drop to the six and the Rockets don't pass the Trailblazers for the three, I think the Jazz make it all the way to the Western Conference Finals. Beating the Trailblazers, beating the Nuggets. What about the Clippers, Thunder, and Spurs? They would have to do their own thing. I think, like, just if it holds, you know what I mean? So if it holds as the Clippers pass the Jazz... But they, the Thunder and Spurs don't pass. So if I think if the if the seating goes like this: Warriors one, Nuggets two, Blazers three, Rockets four, Clippers five, Jazz six. Like the Jazz, Jazz make it six. All the way that's an easy Western first round. Finals. That's an easy first round win against the Blazers because yeah. I don't think anybody expects anything from them anymore. Not much at all. Because yes. like yeah, like Dame is still great, but like it's him and then like Evan Turner after that. So I mean, it's hard to dispute that, but. What I will go on the record saying is that, like, I think the Jazz have a chance to beat the Rockets potentially. I don't know. Yeah. I don't. The only I wouldn't say that that's out of the question. It's not out of the question. I just don't think they could beat the Warriors. That's my only concern. Well, who's going to beat the Warriors? The Rockets. You think so? 
I think so. They've done it before. They have. I think they're ready for seven games this year. I mean, look, Harden's not on a hot stretch right now, but I think that the reason for that is because he's saving That's, his shooting for the playoffs. You have a common rule of basketball is you have to get your misses out of the way before the makes can come. So he was like, damn, I'm making too many shots. Law of averages is going to come back and bite me in the butt. I have to start missing shots. Exactly. He's so doing I it can't on have my misses come in the playoffs. My misses need to come down the stretch when we've already locked up a playoff spot. And it's so I know that if I'm hitting shots and I'm good enough, even if we drop down to the fifth or sixth seed, which definitely won't happen, we can still win games. And he's that good. He's just that good that he can miss shots on purpose to do that. Yeah, Chris Paul's probably on his side for that. Yeah, oh yeah, I don't see why not. Austin Rivers came out with a quote today and said, if those boys keep playing D, they are a title contender. He's not wrong. He's not wrong. I mean, they can match up with teams all the way through. Yes, because... Because Chris Paul is an elite defensive point guard. Still. Harden, when he tries, can be an elite defensive player. Yep. I think that P.J. Tucker is a good on-ball defender. Eric Gordon, when he wants to, he can be a good defensive player. And then Clint, mm-hmm. Ca- Clint Capella is Clint Capella. I yes. mean, he's Around the seven, rim, he will protect exactly yes. and he's seven feet tall he's got a vertical he's got the longest arms aside from Giannis in the NBA mm-hmm. I mean he's just a beast so now let's do a little change up on the pod we said that Matt's not here today but I think it might be worth it to give him a little buzz see if he wants to have some chatter and he doesn't know he's going to be on the podcast today so a little surprise action here we'll see if he see how he reacts we'll see if he even picks up here we go He does not answer this phone call. I swear to God. I will light his house on fire. Should we just, like, call somebody else to mess with them? Might have to. Might have to call Ben. Might have to call Ben. Hey, this is Matt Earl. I can't come to the phone right now, but I got your message. I'll call you back soon. Wow. Should we leave a message or no? Record your message after the tone. Simply hang up when done. Thank you. Or for delivery options, press the pound sign. Delivery options? I don't know what delivery options are, but hello, Mr. Herb. We are calling to uh, let you know you were supposed to be on the pod at this moment in time. Not live, but on the phone, and we needed you. We thought you were dedicated enough where you'd pick up, but... Just a phone call, you know? That's all it is. We're just trying to buzz in. Just a phone call. I'm a little hurt, a little little saddened by this news that I'm not as important as I thought in your life, so... I second that. We're going to have to take this up on a serious matter some other day. Yeah, we might have to talk about this on the pod next week. Yes. If you're here. If, if. I mean, come on. At this rate, what, is, what does he think he is? But maybe if you hear this, you'll give us a call back and we can get you in on a little insight. And we'll answer the phone. Yes. Oh, we will. Don't worry. Cheers. <laughs> Peace out. Gosh, who does that guy think he is, huh? I don't know if I can look him in the eye anymore. I can't. That's absurd. I play volleyball with him. I make eye contact with him. When we're playing, so that we can be on the same page, but now I'm going to have to look at his forehead or something like that. It's not going to work. I'm going to have to wear spoons over my eyes. It's just how it's going to go. That would look very interesting on the court. Yes, but it might have to happen. I'll get some Taco Fall rec specs. Yo, speaking of volleyball, I don't. you remember that one ball that I hit when we were like, scrimmaging and I put it straight down like into your throat? Demolished. I think I hit that like right in front of you, and you're just like, "Wow, I couldn't, I can't get to that." I literally was like, "That is something I've never seen before." I was doing, I was taking a little uh, note out of uh, your book, playing some bully ball. That's you know, all it is. You know what I'm talking about? A little bit of, a little bit of BB. I've bully learned, ball. I've learned my bully ball through the ways of just maybe Kobe Bryant, just the way he just dominates people, and you just got to get in their face. You got to let them know you are bullying them, and that's what I do, and I just replicate that, and I was bullied. I am a victim. <laughs> At that point. We're all victims. Yes. Oh, yes. I was a victim of my own bully ball because I knew that I was impacting my teammates. Or, I, I don't know, like, what What do you call... When you're doing a scrimmage, this might be a remarkably dumb question, mm-hmm. but when you're in a scrimmage with your teammates, is the other team, are they your opponents or your teammates? Definitely your opponents. I get so competitive. Even in a scrimmage, I get so competitive. I don't lose. So that's why I would get frustrated. But they. What happened yesterday? Did you win or lose? Oh, we lost. That's right. Yes. That is right. And was I still mad about it an hour and a half later? Yes. Furious. You know what? That makes me happy to know that you were mad about it an hour and a half later. Because I like having emotional impact on my opponents. My longevity was definitely destroyed. Good. But let's do a little Celtics talk. A little bit of C's talk. So I got a question for you, Yanni. Yep. I think that one problem that we've had this season is that 
we don't really know, like, yeah, we've got our starting five, but we don't really know who, like, the ending five is. And I feel like coming into the playoffs, that's a really important thing to get knocked out of the way. Because I don't see them going far if it's a different five every night. So I want to know, who would you have in there? Would you do, like, a substitution type thing where maybe you have Marcus Smart playing when you need defense, you bring in Hayward or Brown when you need offense? I just want to know where you stand on that and what kind of players you'd want to see down the stretch. I think you hit the head on the nail. I think if we're going to go far, we're going to need that five. But I think it's going to be that six through two different situations. I think if we are winning, the five is going to be Kyrie. Al Horford. Al Horford. Hold on. Hold on, folks. Jason Tatum. My five will continue after this message. Hello. Hello. How are we doing, Mr. Sir? Hello. How is it going? Pretty good. You're live on the podcast right now. Matt, you sound good today. Wow, live? Live. Wow, okay. I'm honored. I'm glad that I could be thrown in from home today. <laughs> yeah. Long distance. We're Matt, trying to keep the relationship alive. Matt, do you want to give us I a little uh, health update? Health update? Yeah, I took a three-hour nap uh, after my meeting today at uh, 9 a.m. And I went to Dunkin' Donuts to pick up some uh, food for myself, just clean my bathroom, now I'm laying back in bed. What did you get from Dunks? I got uh, some munchkins and uh, a bacon, egg, and cheese, and I definitely overpaid for all of that. They like, definitely shouldn't have gotten munchkins. Like usual, yes. That's a nice, healthy, like get, get yourself back on your feet <laughs> snack, right? Yes, I know. I'm starting to feel a little better. I'm going to probably lay down again at some point, and then I'll be ready for tonight. Good. So, um, how's your bracket looking uh, so far? This is off topic from what we were talking about, but what we have you. So, so uh, for my sweet, sweet 16 last night, I, I thought I went uh, two for four. So I think uh, I got a Virginia right and I got a Gonzaga right. But uh, I thought I had Michigan winning, but I did not. I had Texas. Uh, I checked again. I had Texas Tech winning. So I was pretty proud of myself for that. And that big Tennessee Purdue upset. That was quite the game. I don't know if you guys watched the full thing, but it was oh, quite, yes. quite the egg in the second half. We've talked about it a lot. The shots that Purdue hit. The just yeah, no, no, that, that, that Klein kid Purdue making a six for seven on three pointers coming in clutch was a <laughs> craziness. Crazy. When they kept when, absolutely crazy. When they kept cutting to his dad, I was, like, looking at the guy, and I was like, this man is about to have a heart attack. <laughs> he was getting so excited, and he was yeah. so anxious. It was ridiculous. Yeah, it was, it was definitely the game so, so far. I probably, for me personally, I've put it ahead of the uh, Duke-UCF uh, game right now. I think uh, so as well. So yes. That's what March yeah. is all about, my yeah. friend. All right, so yeah, we... Yeah, Tennessee going to the, to the Final Four, too. Yeah, so most people I, did, I sadly. Yeah, yeah, most people did, so... Not a good look, but we're in the midst right now of a little Celtics. The five guys on the court for the last five minutes of the game. Who do you got? Uh, who, who's, 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 is the question, who's my, who am I putting the first five on? Like, who's my starting five? No, who are the five guys you want closing out a playoff game for the Celtics? For the Celtics, uh, it's, I mean, obviously it's got to be Kyrie Irving. Um, that's pretty much a given. Uh, I think Marcus Smart, as I've talked to you guys before, is such an underrated player, and he's he's such a good pairing with Kyrie Irving because he doesn't need the ball in his hands to be effective. He can dish out, get a bunch of assists, uh, and uh, he's just a great match one with a scoring that is Kyrie Irving. I'd put uh, Jason Tatum out there too. Al Horford obviously in the five, and then I'd probably put I'd probably stick with Marcus Morris too. I, I like the starting lineup that uh, Brad Stevens has been going with so uh, for recent games. All right, I was pretty similar to yours. I was doing it situa- situationally wise, and I said if we needed offense, the guy Marcus Smart is not in, and Jalen Brown is in with the way he's shooting. Yeah. But I'm yeah, yeah, he's, he's playing pretty well. Yeah, I'm very on page with you here. I I kind of differ. Mar- Marcus Smart brings defense that Jalen Brown doesn't. So when it's, when it's when we need them to when it's like playoff time, where a defense is going to be needed. Yeah. That's yeah, my only, my only suggestion there. And that this is where the problem comes in for me. It's Marcus Morris has like he's probably our best guy for defending against like a big athletic forward. That said, his shot selection down the stretch is unbelievably bad, and you could pin a couple of losses on him for shooting dumb threes early in the shot clock, breaking them, and then everything's down here from there because guys are like, "Why would you take that shot?" <coughs> and they get frustrated and whatnot, and it's just like. I'd rather have Gordon Hayward, who makes good decisions with the basketball out there. Like, is that crazy to think to not have Morris out there? Well, I, th- well, I think we all know that Morris is a better defender. And if you remember back in uh, the finals last year, he claimed that he he thinks he's the best player to guard LeBron James. So I think defensively, Marcus Morris is your guy. But I agree with you that he hasn't been making the best choices 
in his shot selection. My only problem with Gordon Hayward is that in transition, he's not. It's hard for him to keep up with some of those fast guys. So he could be a liability there. But he's. Got, I think Gordon Hayward would, would most likely make the smarter basketball, but whether it's passing it or, or dishing it out or you know, or taking a good shot. shot. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I agree. So. Good looks. I got one final question for you. Yes, sir. How long are you on the DL for? And also, don't listen to the message we left because we kind of roasted you a little bit. Very much so. Just to lead it. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm, I'm sure I'll be fine uh, sooner rather than later. I, I'm upset that I had to miss the podcast today. Uh, but I'm sure the messages you sent me is something to do with LeBron James. And, again, I, I would I would suggest that, uh, that we, uh, you know, don't, don't hate him. Don't don't hate me for hate for for not hating him as much as you guys. Listen, one last note for you. One of my good friends said last night took an L, but tonight I bounced back, and that is you, my friend. That that, that is what I'm going with today. I'm hoping to be rested for a uh, for a good night of uh, being together tonight. So Let's go. I hope I hope to uh, feel better, but uh, I'm I'm about to go take a nap again. So uh, thank you thank you guys for having me on and make, letting me be a part of it. Even we though, wish uh, you well, my friend. We wish you well. Drink some tea, Matt. I, I'm, I'm drinking so I'll drink some tea and uh, tell producer Ben uh, I said hello as well shout he's, out he's producer a, Ben he's a, he's a fan favorite for sure by far yes. we will we will we'll see you soon alright see you soon and that's your Matt Herb right there yeah a little Merbology for the day <laughs> so yeah let's keep going with the Celtics talk I mean I think that with the Kyrie lineup yes you want to have guys who are just going to be like content with beating the ball to Kyrie, i.e. Marcus Smart, Al Horford, and then you have Tatum, who should be a great secondary scorer in that situation. But if we learned anything from that Cavaliers game, is that Tatum is at his best when he is the primary scorer. Yes. He is not a second fiddle kind of player. No. By any means. There's so much malleability with this team where you can go with a ton of different lineups and they'll still be good, and finding the optimal one... It's tough. Might, it, it's tough because it might mean taking your best players off the floor. Right which is part of the thing. And I think that if we're looking at an optimal end-of-the-game lineup, you should want Tatum out there, and I do want Tatum out there because he's a big shot maker, but you need to have Kyrie out there, and I don't think Kyrie works great with Tatum on the floor. I know that they have good off-the-court chemistry, but like it's just the way their game styles mesh isn't natural. They both natural. need the ball. They both need the ball to score. And they both need to set themselves up rather than getting set up. My only problem I have with Kyrie... We, me and Kyrie have been in a little bit of a rough patch as of this whole entire season. We were good. I called him Byrie. We were bad. Called him Kyle. Now we're back to Byrie. But the only problem I have with him is he can't expect to take the last shot every single time. I know he's the best shooter. I know he should get the last shot every time. But he should not expect to take the last shot every time. Because if that's his expectations then the Celtics are going to have real problems with those last second shot attempts and like the plays Brad Steven draws up because Kyrie gets so frustrated when he is not the one taking the last shot, win or lose, which I get. He's the best player. I get it. But to win those games, you need the best shot. It doesn't matter if the best player gets the best shot. You need the best shot. Well, and that's the only problem I have with him at the moment. That leads perfectly into my point because I think what it should be for the last shot is you give the ball to Kyrie. No questions asked. You give the ball to Kyrie. If he has an open shot, beautiful. Take it. He's a great shot maker. Yep. If not... You just can't force these bad shots. That's the thing right He needs there. to look out and realize Jason Tatum, Gordon Hayward, Jalen Brown, all these guys are there to get good shots off. And I understand that you got remember, we remember the Magic game where Hayward passed it into Tatum. That Who sparked, was pretty open. Yes. It sparked a lot open. of controversy. That yeah. sparked all the controversy right there. But I don't know. I think the right move is putting the ball in Kyrie's hands because he's a, just a huge playmaker and it's 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 as simple as that yes he just has to have the mindset that he's going to have to make the play not make the shot if you know what i'm trying to say yeah I, i'm fully on the same page he's got to be making the play the shot because is, i can't remember which game it was but he took this sh- it wasn't a buzzer beater attempt but it was late yeah. in the game it was a few games ago i can't remember which game exactly but we were watching it Kyrie gets the ball takes two dribbles three dribbles Throws up the worst shot I've ever seen in my remember, entire life. Celtics lose. I remember that one. That one was tough to, tough a to watch. A frustrating game. It was the game where we blew it. We were up like 18 and we blew it. I can't remember the game off the top of my head. Yeah, I'm But it was against trouble. a team that we did not deserve to lose against. And we blew a fourth quarter lead. I was sitting there in astonishment that this team 
could blow that big of a lead and not even just like be phased by it. Like this, these are games like we don't have to win necessarily, but games we need to win. Games we should win at least. Should win, yes. Yeah, I believe that was the Hornets game. Oh yes, yes, Kemba, yeah. Kemba. Yeah, we, we, we uh, Kemba went on a thirty, or Kemba and the Hornets went on a thirty to five run. Yes, to that's close what it was. Out that game. Thank you. Kemba's killed the Celtics all week, all year long. All year long. And that's been the stem of a lot of controversy, too, because at the end of that game, Kyrie was indirectly calling out Brad Stevens for the defensive game plan that just hasn't worked against Kemba this year. And I don't know. Brad Stevens has done a good job throughout his entire coaching career coming up with game plans, whether it be defensive or offensive. I mean, the Celtics have been a top-flight defensive team basically throughout his whole tenure until this year. And, like, it's hard to pin down that on one player because... We had a good defensive team when we had the biggest defensive liability in the history of the sport and Isaiah Thomas playing a lead role. I'm starting to personally think that Stevens might be a little in over his head with Kyrie. Because Maybe Stevens, with Kyrie, yes. But Brad, he always has coached teams where you play on both ends of the court and that's it. And he said a quote, I think last week, he said, I've never had a team that's so reliant on making or missing shots. And I think he was indirectly referring to the fact that you can miss shots on a certain night and still win games through your hard work on the defensive end, and this is not that team. And also through taking smart shots, getting to the foul line, stuff like that. It's something we don't see them do as often. We see them taking 30 shots from three, only hitting four of them. You know, like, it's games where you know that you're off from three and they keep taking them. It just doesn't make any sense to me, and it's so frustrating. But the other, the thing about the kicker for me, is you look at every team that Stevens has coached, yes, he's had his stars, but all these teams have been cohesive units that play well together. And have fun. And have fun. Like, you look at when we first acquired Isaiah Thomas, yes, he was the primary scorer, but all the guys on the team were really on the same page with, like, what they had to do and how they would be effective to help the team. Like, I look back to the playoff series we had a couple of years ago against the Wizards when Kelly Olenek was the star of the series. Like, who would have thought? Game seven, the neared, the goat. He scored 26 points, 14 points in the fourth quarter, and I don't think anybody was happier for him than Isaiah Thomas. Exactly. It's things like that. We that had guys here who wanted to be here and who wanted to play with each other, and that was the difference. I'm not saying Kyrie doesn't want to be here, but I'm not not saying Kyrie wants to be here. I'm just, I think what you're trying to say is that Kyrie wants to be the guy every time, yes. and he's more concerned about him making the play than he is about the team making the play, if that makes sense. It does. I feel that. And that's frustrating for your superstar to be in that mindset. Very. It's just, I don't know. That's just how it goes, I guess. Yeah, so another thing that I want to bring up, this is not basketball talk, so we're going a little bit off of the usual lingo on the Hoopcats podcast, but... Did you read about uh, Greg Schiano stepping down from the defensive coordinator position for the Pats? You, you see that? I did not. Yeah, so Schiano was hired after Brian Flores' departure. And then yesterday, he stepped down from the position. And his quote as to why he was leaving is that he wanted to spend more time. He said, The direct quote is, I need to spend more time on my faith and family. I don't know what to make of that. He's been a defensive coordinator at Ohio State over the last three years, so that's a pretty intense program, especially with Urban Meyer, who's a scumbag. So, Honestly, we breed defensive coordinators, though. We'll get it. We'll figure it out. We'll get someone. We're the Pats. I mean, mean, come on. Look, as long as Dante Scarnecchia is on that (laughs) coaching staff, like, we're good. We're all set. Forget about it. We'll take it. And a bag of chips. Yeah, so moving back to the basketball, Yanni, I think you got next up. Yeah, so my next up of the week is... Someone who might not even make the league, honestly, but gave me the biggest heart attack I've ever had in my whole entire life. And honestly, almost made me pass out for the third time, which was Aubrey Dawkins of UCF. I mean, I've never seen someone who's never been talked about in an NBA conversation have such an NBA-style game with the shots he was making, with the separation he was creating. This kid was unleashed. Unleashed. And he's the son of, for those who don't know, son of Johnny Dawkins. I mean, they said it a billion times. Who was the coach? Johnny Dawkins um, was the second leading scorer under Coach K, I believe. He was Coach K's, like, first ever, like, guy. 
And just to see that transition, to see what this kid did, I mean, if, like, a heart attack and, like, anxiety had a baby, it was grabbing my leg and just tearing me away. It was awful. It was awful. Yeah. I was on my couch. I was standing on, like, the the back part of my couch, holding myself up from the roof. It was just that intense. It was that intense. I had no words. Yes. I had no words. I was frozen. Yeah, another thing, um, after his performance, he is now projected to be, according to NBADraft.net, the 60th pick. Wow. Going the, potentially going to the Bucks. Someone take a chance with him. I think somebody will, because he's an older player. Yes. He's a junior this year, although, Yanni, you were telling me that he played two years at Michigan, yep. took a year or two off, and then transferred to UCF, where he's been playing ever since. Right. So, he was born in 95. He's about 22, 23 years old going into the draft. And his stats aren't anything crazy. No. But moves like he was making, shots like he was making. He was making these unbelievable fluid three-pointers where he was coming off screens. He was making, st- he even had a couple of step-back threes where he looked really good. Like and this next, is a guy, next level stuff. This is next a guy, level. his first two years in college basketball in 2014, 2015, he was scoring six point. Six point six and a half points per game and seven points per game. Shooting like he had a good shooting percentage from the field, fifty percent both years approximately. But still, those are that's not even Europe numbers. Right. Like those guys aren't even going to play in Europe. Right. But I'm looking at his last five games. Cincinnati, March seventh, didn't do anything. He only had five points. Saturday, uh, March 9th against Temple, a sixty two to sixty seven loss. He did not miss a shot and scored thirty six points. Crazy. Which is unbelievable. Crazy. On the biggest stage ever. That was the most watched college basketball game of all time, I think. Yeah. Not, a, not college basketball game, excuse me. College basketball tournament game of all time. I think there was 12.9 million viewers of that game. Oh, wait, no, that's the Duke Crazy. game you're talking about, right? Or that round. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Oh, I'm talking about the Temple game oh, from back okay. in the day. But, yeah, okay. he had an amazing game, 36-11. and 11. But, yeah, the Crazy. Duke game was unbelievable, 32 Crazy. points. Crazy. Three boards, four assists, three steals, two, one of which was really clutch. But they still lost, so I don't know how clutch that is, but, like, still. I think he'll. he's a potential impact player. I don't know. Anybody that can shoot and has a body like that, because he's a bigger player, they can have a role on an NBA team. That's why he's next up this week. So, to close out the podcast, I was thinking we'd do a little bit of fantasy baseball talk because I just had three drafts and that's like all that's going through my head right now. <laughs> I'm in a league where I pay $100 to get into it and last year I came in 11th place out of 12. The year before that I came in 8th place out of 13. So I've basically thrown, I've taken $200, put it in my dishwasher, pooped on it and then <laughs> didn't even like give it to anybody. So I don't know what I'm doing. I'm in second place right now after one day. But I made a terribly dumb decision where I kept Robinson Cano on my bench yesterday. He hit a home run on the first pitch he saw. A little unexpected. And then it was against Scherzer. I yes. mean, like, give me a break. One of the best pitchers in baseball. My, my thought process was I can either play Nico Goodrum, who is the hottest hitter in all of spring training, against Marcus Stroman, who hasn't been good for two years. Or I can let Robinson Cano, who was suspended for 80 games last year, hit against Max Scherzer. Even basketball fans know who Max Scherzer is. He's a stud. Yep. But I was wrong. But I'm in second place. I probably would be in first place if I played him, but whatever. Craziness. But that's how it rolls sometimes. Yeah, so decisions. That's, You're that, the GM. That's my GM talk for the day. Yanni, any closing points you want to make? It's been a pleasure. We've had a good pod today. I've appreciated the talk and roll, roll Devils tonight and Sunday, hopefully. We'll yeah. see you next week in the Final Four. Yeah, I'm looking forward to a Blue Devils win tonight. I think that that should be a good one. And, yeah, we look forward to having Murb back on the podcast the next week, and hopefully we'll have some more special guests as the weeks go on. If Duke loses tonight, don't expect me to be on the podcast. I will probably be still passed out or just dead. So, good luck. Yeah, according to uh, Chad, who's Yanni's roommate, when Duke loses, Yanni goes into fetal position for hours yes, on end. it's sad. It's but... something that's very difficult to watch. Mm-hmm. Frankly, it's difficult to think about. <laughs> but, hey, he's a dedicated fan, and you got to respect him for that. Got to respect him that's for it. That's how it goes. All right, well, I'd like to thank our producer, Benjamin Strawbridge. We'll be back next week for a little bit of more podcast action. Hopefully Matt's back, as I said earlier. And thank you very much for listening to the TNH Hoopcats podcast on the TNH Podcast Network. My name is Sam Eggert. I'm along here with Yanni Kakoris, and we will see you next week. Hoopcats, Outcats.